Good morning. We have general questions. Question number one, Angus MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will approve the Falkirk Council Development Plan Scheme 2014. Minister Derek Mackay. The Falkirk Local Development Plan was submitted to the Directorate for Planning and Environmental Appeals on the 20th of February and reporters from the DPEA appointed on the 21st of February to carry out an examination of unresolved representations to the plan. Following completion of this examination, an examination report will be sent to Falkirk Council. Recommendations contained within the examination report are largely binding on the Council, and Scottish Ministers expect process from appointment to reporting to normally take around six months, but rarely exceeding nine months. Angus MacDonald. I thank the Minister for his reply. Um, clearly, one of the most contentious planning issues in the Falkirk area is the application for unconventional gas extraction, which has resulted in a PLI. Whilst recognising the Minister cannot comment on live applications, it is clear the Scottish Government's commitment to introducing buffer zones between unconventional gas developments and communities in the new SPP is very welcome uh, for communities affected. However, can the Minister confirm that local authorities will be able to take action retrospectively in respect of buffer zones for applications received during the existing SPP? Minister. Uh, to be clear, decisions on planning applications and appeals are required to be made in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations uh, indicate otherwise at the time the decision is made. The new Scottish uh, planning policy and all other evidence submitted will be a material consideration that will be taken into account when applications and appeals are decided. The reporters from the Directorate of Planning and Environmental Appeals dealing with the two appeals for coal, methane bed, extraction production in the Falkirk and Stirling Council areas have held inquiry and hearing sessions as well as uh, accompanied site inspections in March and April of this year. The reporters have also decided to take additional evidence from parties uh, once the new Scottish planning policy is adopted, uh, targeted for June. An additional inquiry session will be held for this evidence. Therefore, the reporters dealing with these appeals will therefore take the new Scottish planning policy into account when they make their decisions on these appeals. Question two, Alex Ferguson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact it considers Police Scotland has had on policing in Dumfries and Galloway. Cabinet Secretary, Kenny McCaskill. Uh, Thirteen months on from the successful transition to the new policing arrangements, policing in Scotland continues to perform excellently. There are a thousand more police officers on our streets compared to 2007, and confidence and satisfaction in the police is high. Dumfries and Galloway now has access to specialist equipment and expertise whenever and wherever it is needed. This includes a human trafficking unit, national rape investigation, and an air support unit. And there is also increased flexibility for police officers to work in Dumfries and Galloway area when needed. Alex Ferguson. I am grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Well, one of the great successes of Dumfries and Galloway Police Force was the impact of community policing, which has resulted in the lowest rates of juvenile crime on record. Now, with the advent of Police Scotland, overtime for working on public holidays has been removed and replaced with an extra nine days holiday per year. This has left each policeman and woman £1,000 worse off a year. But more importantly, perhaps, the community policing service as a whole with a consequential reduction of manpower. So let me ask the Cabinet Secretary how he thinks that that reduction of effort in community policing will help to keep juvenile crime at its current low level. And is this not just a typical example of a one-size-fits-all policy being pursued by Police Scotland in a rural environment where that policy simply doesn't work? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think there's two items. First of all, the change in terms of terms and conditions was negotiated by the Scottish Police Federation uh, with the uh, police uh, uh, senior management team. It was wanted by the Scottish Police Federation and has been done with their support and their approval. Uh, if Mr uh, Ferguson disagrees, then clearly he can raise it with the Federation representatives who are elected by rank and file members. And with regard to policing, what I can say is that the policing in the community remains strong because of this government's commitment to 1,000 additional officers. South of the border, where Mr Ferguson's party are the lead in the coalition government, we have seen a drop of 15 per cent in police numbers in Northumbria. I think Dumfries and Galloway is well served and the Federation welcomes changes that have taken place. Question number three, John Wilson. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Cabinet Secretary for Commonwealth Games, Sports, Equalities and Pensioners' Rights has had regarding the provision of late-night or overnight commuted rail services 
during the Commonwealth Games. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. Thank you. I, I can advise that officials from Transport Scotland have worked closely with ScotRail and Network Rail to provide train services departing Glasgow later than ever before during the, the period of the Commonwealth Games. This includes late night services connecting Edinburgh, Perth and Stirling as well as stations in Lanarkshire, Ayrshire, Renfrewshire and Inverclyde. This will help ensure spectators can enjoy the sporting and live events on throughout the city and travel home via the train. John Wilson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. And since the Commonwealth Games are to be a car-free event, particularly with the proposed road restrictions and closures, could the Cabinet Secretary indicate how the transport providers will get that message out to residents throughout central Scotland that the easy transport links that will be provided by either bus or rail to ensure that those wishing to attend the Commonwealth Games have the opportunity to do so. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank uh, John Wilson for his, his question. Um, the additional capacity and late night services uh, throughout central Scotland um, will, are, are very important in uh, diverting people off of the roads and, and out of their cars. Passengers on the Airdrie to Bathgate line will be able to take advantage of those late night departures to stations serving North Lanarkshire. A communication strategy, of course, is important, as the member has highlighted, to make sure the public are aware of their public transport options. And I'm happy to write to the member with more detail uh, of that strategy. Duncan McNeill. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, last week it was announced that an additional 100,000 tickets for all of the events in the open and closing ceremonies would now be available to the public. How will the Cabinet Secretary ensure that these additional tickets go, uh, are directed to sports clubs and those who participate in sports clubs who are currently being asked to share only 1,000 tickets? Can we do more, Cabinet Secretary? I think that is wide of the mark. We are talking about real services, but if the Cabinet Secretary wishes to answer it, she can go ahead. I am happy to answer that. Um, we always want to do more, and one of the, uh, the key uh, groups that we identified that we wanted to promote the legacy tickets to were those who give to sport day in, day out, whether that is as volunteers and the, their local groups and communities and sports organisations. And uh, Sports Scotland are one of the agencies that the legacy tickets tickets are going to be distributed through. But what I'm happy to do is to write to the member with more details of that. And if we can go further, then obviously we will go further. Question number four, Patricia Ferguson. To ask the Scottish Government when it will implement the recommendations of Lord Cullen's review of fatal accident inquiry legislation. Cabinet Secretary, Kenny McCaskill. Uh, the Government is committed to bringing forward a bill to implement the recommendation of Lord Cullen's 2009 review of the fatal accident inquiry legislation within the lifetime of this Parliament. Some of Lord Cullen's recommendations were addressed to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and have already been implemented, including the establishment of a Scottish Fatalities Investigation Unit. Patricia Ferguson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, and I'm sure that he would want to join with me in marking the fact that the families of those who lost their lives in the Stockline explosion are preparing to commemorate the 10th anniversary of that disaster on Sunday. But does the Cabinet Secretary not think that we owe it to families bereaved by workplace accidents to have in place the best possible fatal accident inquiry system? And will the Scottish Government, if it has no immediate plans of its own to legislate in this area, now back, at least in principle, the bill that I will shortly introduce to Parliament? Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, I would obviously pay tribute to all those that lost their lives in the Stockline uh, uh, tragedy. Uh, equally pay tribute to all those who have worked in sense to try and work out what happened so that we learn lessons, both in terms of fatal accidents and indeed in terms of the uh, problems and issues that existed there, including uh, the Lord President who presided over the inquiry. Uh, we are intent on taking action. It was for that reason that we instructed Lord Cullen. Uh, we do have challenges within the parliamentary timetable, but we are uh, committed to acting as expeditiously as possible. We have, as I say, made sure that the matters that can be dealt with without uh, primary legislation, such as those falling within the domain of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service are dealt with. We have been in communication with Lord Cullen to see whether there was any updating that he wished to do to his review, but he's satisfied with where matters stand. So I can give the uh, member the assurance that we want to get the best possible legislation and we will do so within our period of office. Question number five, Graham Pearson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the issues associated with the open cast mines in South Scotland. 
Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President officer, the liquidation of both SRG and ATH in 2013 led to 726 redundancies in Scotland's coal industry and left many sites in an unrestored state. In response, Fergus Ewing established a cross-party task force to address the situation and created the Scottish Mines Restoration Trust to assist local authorities in the restoring of these sites. Since the initiation of the task force in April 2013, a total of 450 jobs have been created in the sector, and this is forecast to increase to 550 jobs by the end of this year. As an action from the task force, the Scottish Government launched a formal planning consultation open-cast coal restoration effective regulation, inviting views on revisions to planning policy and advice. Graham Pearson. I uh, am very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that reply and his interest in this matter. Uh, can the uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary uh, acknowledge also the environmental damage wrecked by the open-cast mining companies who are no longer trading, particularly in East Ayrshire? Uh, communities there currently feel abandoned to suffer the devastated landscape with no sign of repair. Has the task force decided on a plan to deal with this particular issue and a timescale to deliver? Cabinet Secretary. I, 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 I quite appreciate the concerns that uh, Mr Pearson has raised on behalf of constituents in the East Ayrshire area. Um, this is a, a, a very difficult situation that has arisen out of the, um, the collapse of the companies involved and um, it re leaves serious implications for local residents around the particular sites. It is a priority of the task force to address the very issue that Mr Pearson has raised and to find a way in which um, restoration work can be um, made possible. And uh, that is an urgent and ongoing priority of the task force. And I give Mr Pearson the assurance that as soon as there is um, a clear uh, plan of action that can take forward and address many of these issues, that will be fully reported to Parliament by Mr Ewing. Question number six, James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure that all staff working on Scottish Government contracts are paid the living wage. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Uh, we are committed to supporting the Scottish living wage and have done so in our pay policy for the duration of this Parliament. Um, we uh, are taking steps through um, the uh, normal work of procurement to ensure that all possible steps are taken to ensure that staff that are working on Scottish Government contracts are paid uh, at least the living wage. We cannot make payment of the living wage a mandatory requirement on our public contracts. However, we are seeking urgent clarification from the Commission on what more can be done within EU law to help ensure that we and public bodies can lawfully encourage their contractors to pay staff involved in delivering their contracts a living wage. James Kelly. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. I previously asked the Cabinet Secretary to conduct a review of the low pay loophole to certain how many staff contracted by public sector bodies are denied the living wage. I believe there is a moral the moral achievement of paying the living wage is undermined if you have civil servants on salary scales far above it, but cleaning and catering staff who have not been paid the living wage. Recent UGov research Can we just get a question, Mr Kelly? Sure. UGov research shows 78 per cent of people believe employers should reveal how many staff pay the living wage. With that in mind, question, can Mr. the Cabinet Kelly. Secretary confirm that the review of the low pay loophole has begun and if it will report before next Tuesday's stage three of the procurement bill. Cabinet Secretary. I think the, well, I think the, the, the position on the ability to make the living wage mandatory in terms of public sector contracts I think has been pretty well discussed within Parliament already and of course it will be the subject of discussion at the stage three proceedings of the public procurement bill. But I do want to say to Mr Kelly that the Government does take its commitments on the Scottish living wage very seriously and we are taking active steps in relation to contracts that are uh, being taken forward for renewal within the Scottish Government that we use every opportunity we can through those contract processes to encourage contractors to pay staff involved in delivering these contracts a living wage. That is practical action that we are taking in uh, advancing the letting of future contracts that the Government um, will let for these services. And of course, we will advise Parliament of progress that is made on these questions as these contracts are concluded. 
Question 7, Rob Gibson. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the reports that at a recent EU Environment Council meeting, the Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs breached an agreement to raise Scotland's position on genetically modified crops. Minister Paul Beelhouse. Uh, that is indeed the case. At March, Environment Council Owen Paterson agreed to raise the need uh, for any EU agreement allowing member states to make their own decisions about growing GM crops to permit Scotland and other devolved governments to take our own decisions and not be bound by UK government views. However, he failed to do so. Uh, I wrote to Mr Paterson on 13 March to express my disappointment as, at this omission and to seek assurances that the UK government will work to correct the failure to speak on behalf of Scotland's interests and ensure that any EU agreement allows for devolved governments to uphold a ban on GM crops should be wished to do so. I also sought a commitment from Mr Paterson that following any deal in Europe, the UK Government would work with Scotland and the other devolved administrations to ensure regional bans become a reality in the UK. I have yet to receive a reply from Mr Paterson on these points. Bob Gibson. Uh, I note the Minister's detailed answer. Um, Scottish policy opposes GM crops, so any regionalisation of decision-taking which allows Westminster to bring in approved GM crops in England would need to be legally watertight. Does the Scottish Government agree that a decision on this matter should be delayed until the new Parliament and Commission is confirmed. Minister. Um, it's, it's up to Brussels to work out the timetable for this agreement, and in fact, it's not possible now for legislation uh, to be passed until after the new European Parliament is in place. I, I agree with Rob Gibson's point. It's essential this legislation is legally watertight. Uh, the government would welcome the ability to have a ban on GM cultivation enshrined in EU law, but it's essential that it is safe from legal challenge. Question number eight, Chick Brody. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made in reducing the financing of repeat prescriptions. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presenting officer, the significant proportion of spend in drugs is in supporting patients with complex, severe and enduring conditions which necessarily involves repeat prescribing, and this will continue in the context of an ageing population and the increase in prevalence of long-term conditions. It is extremely important to ensure that this does not lead to unnecessary waste through over-prescribing. That is why we are developing the Scottish Therapeutics Utility, which is currently being piloted in four NHS board areas, which will help GP practices identify areas of potential medicines waste within their repeat prescribing systems. We aim to roll out that software to all boards <coughs> during the current financial year. Chick Brody. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Two years ago, in an answer to a similar question, the Cabinet Secretary uh, advised that there was an estimated cost of £30 million attributed to some pharmacies not following the process strictures on repeat prescriptions as required. Will the Cabinet Secretary now reinforce the message to all pharmacists and GPs that the process must be followed, and will he seek the equivalent of an amnesty? on medicines and ask patients to return all overprescribed medicines to pharmacists and determine where the health boards might seek recovery of these appropriate costs. Cabinet Secretary. Officer, the scheme the member refers to are not actually NHS pharmaceutical services. He will be aware that officials wrote to all NHS boards and contractors about the negative impact that these schemes can have, and I will absolutely reinforce that point again. In addition, we will continue to discuss this issue with Community Pharmacy Scotland, the National Pharmacy Contractors Body. I understand the point that he makes about an amnesty. However, I do not believe that this would achieve the outcomes he expects. NHS boards have a responsibility to take control of prescribing in their area and to ensure that prescribers prescribe according to patient need and that medicines are not given to patients when they are not needed. I would also say that patients must have a responsibility themselves to order those medicines which they need. The strategies I mentioned earlier will go some way to achieve this, together with GP and pharmacist medicines reviews and reviews of repeat prescriptions. Richard Simpson. Thank you. Uh, is the Minister aware that almost all unused medicines, which Mr Brodie mentioned, uh, resulting mainly from repeat prescribing, are returned to pharmacists and are then incinerated? However, if they're returned to the general practices, 60 of whom are now linked to a charity called Intercare, those medicines, if appropriate, will be used in sub-Sahara Africa on, on uh, order. 
will he meet with me to discuss how we can promote this alternative to burning millions of perfectly usable medicines? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I am aware of that scheme. I'm happy to meet the member because, like him, I would like to see if we can recycle some of these drugs, provided uh, safety isn't compromised, uh, recycle some of these drugs to Africa and elsewhere. Before we move to the next item of business, members will wish to join me in welcome to the gallery Mr Rafael Catatonia, President of the Regional Council of Lombardy. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has 